Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Novakovsky. Uh, I'm on the board of directors for the Catholic Art Institute. And as of the composer on the board of directors, it's my particular thrill and pleasure to introduce our final and keynote speaker. Uh, our next speaker hardly needs any introduction. Born in working class Scotland, Sir James Macmillan has risen to become one of the world's most performed composers. Uh, his long form bio is available in your program, but some recent successes I'd like to mention include the release of his Christmas oratorio by the London Philharmonic, and uh, according to recent uh, articles, the triumphant premiere of his second violin concerto by Scottish violin phenom Nicola Benedetti. Uh, he also recently released his autobiography, A Scots Song, A Life in Music. Uh, I will only add that aside from it being a wonderful and heartfelt read, it is the most humbly short autobiography you will ever read from a major figure, ever. So I suggest it for your reading next weekend. Uh, throughout his major successes, he's never shied away from being a public Catholic and has often been willing to take implicitly Catholic positions uh, in a music culture increasingly hostile to our worldview. His talk tonight is called The Ongoing Search for Beauty and the Sacred in Music, but with some wider implications, a Catholic composer's perspective. In the process of his words, he's given many of us great hope in our own works and strivings. So now would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sir James Macmillan. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, for the introduction, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for uh, coming here today. And a big thank you also to Kathleen Carr and all those at the Catholic Art Institute for inviting me to share my thoughts uh, with you today. But to begin with, I'd like to express how deeply impressed I was with the beautiful liturgy today at St. John Cantius Church and with the wonderful choral singing conducted by Massimo Scappin. The liturgy is, of course, the main focus where artists can serve God, as we've heard this afternoon, while drawing the faithful to worship, creating works of excellence, fostering reverence and awe. And perhaps, therefore, you would expect a composer who has attempted to serve the liturgy at times to focus mainly on this issue and on this forum. But my title, which Mark has read to you, although a little vague, uh, suggests that I will be dealing, that I'll be casting my net somewhat wider. So just to remind you what this title is, The Ongoing Search for Beauty and the Sacred in Music, but with some wider implications, a Catholic composer's perspective. And the key words here are ongoing, wider, and Catholic. Yes, I will be reflecting on music's place in society. There's a lot to explore here, considering what the wider culture thinks or doesn't think of classical music. And we cannot ignore the impact that politics have had on the world of music, not just in recent years, but going back through history. Yes, I'll reflect on music in the wider culture, and that culture is deep, and multifaceted with profound and distant roots and beginnings in centuries long gone by, which still resonate with us today. And I'll also reflect on music's place in the soul. And many lovers of music, whether they are conventionally religious like me or not, will claim through their love of music that it is the most spiritual of the arts. That is a bold claim and needs some serious investigation. And I speak not just as a composer of music which has roots in a deep historical culture, but of music which is shaped by theological perspectives a lot of the time. And so I speak subjectively on all these contexts today, and I speak as someone, with, someone of religious faith. Some things I say may resonate with, with you, and some may not. Some things you may agree with, other things you may not. But we all come here today through our shared love of the arts and music 
and indeed the, the love, loving search for beauty and the sacred in the world, and that is a powerful, if mysterious, love. So, this lecture will consider music, but in a series of wider contexts with some wider implications which may take us, take us on quite a bit of a journey from the music itself through its relationships with politics, with history, aesthetics, education, morality, society, and religion, and in particular, mercy. Those of us involved in the arts, or even just those of us who have a keen enthusiasm for literature, theatre, music, opera, film, and so on, will be used to the intermittent discussion of morality in connection with the various forms. We've heard a bit of it today already. Sometimes those discussions branch out to embrace amorality and even immorality, as, as Sandy has pointed out. In my world of classical music, the issue of the composer's beliefs, actions, and influence on those around him, and subsequently in history, can sometimes rise up. The discussion is usually most heated in relation to Richard Wagner and his anti-Semitism and its connection with the rise of Hitler and the Third Reich. Personally, I find this odd, as I can think of many other composers who were just as anti-Semitic as Wagner and far more problematic in their personal behaviors, but are given a free pass when it comes to considering their moral ranking. I was thinking of this recently uh, when I read this review of uh, a new production of Wagner's Lohengrin, um, a review in the, in the Spectator, an English magazine, uh, a new production of Lohengrin at the Royal Opera House earlier this year uh, by Richard Bratby. It, it got me thinking. He says, to be a Wagnerite is to enter the theatre in a state of paranoia. Mainstream culture has decided that Wagner was uniquely wicked. That's just how it is. And it's futile to retort that we seem comparatively relaxed about, say, Richard Strauss's membership of the Reichsmusikkammer or Stravinsky's post-1945 anti-Semitism. Or that within recent memory, Prokofiev's October Cantata, dedicated to Stalin, was presented in the United Kingdom as a bit of kitschy fun. Never mind the dead kulaks enjoy those accordions. True, Wagner was an immeasurably greater artist, so he should be held to higher standards. No quarrel with that, at least not here and not now. But it does mean that in any given production of a Wagner opera, you sit waiting to be clobbered with totalitarian symbolism as the director reaffirms that the man who created this artwork was literally Hitler, capital L, capital H. And in the world of literature, there seems to be continual disruptions and controversies nowadays surrounding writers who are deemed to have written, said, or even thought the wrong thing. Artists from previous centuries are being reappraised according to extra artistic matters relating mainly to historical, political, and social justice issues of the day. And there seems to be new minefields appearing all the time, which threaten the reputations and legacies of major figures throughout the ages. It seems a very modern obsession and predicament, and infused perhaps with the secularity of our age. But in every moral or ethical dilemma and matter, it could be argued there is a religious dimension too. I simply flag up these matters because... Although I will attempt to address a pretty wide context which explores the political and the secular, I do this as a composer who is actually also a religious believer. And towards the end of my lecture, I want to ease into a reflection on what might be described as divine mercy and what this may bring to this topic too. So I spend a lot of time listening to what many different kinds of people have to say about what I do. I find a lot of it fascinating and of immense help, stimulation and encouragement. Who are these people? Well, some are musicologists and critics, of course, but some of them are theologians, attempting to interrogate the world of the arts, 
the imagination, and specifically music, to see if light can be shone on deeper religious considerations. Some of them are social scientists, political minds, who see important points of interface between the world of culture and the way that society can grow, develop, and gain from the insights of artists and musicians. Music has always had a social role, and sometimes that role can intersect with religious concerns. Sometimes music and the other arts even intersect with questions of ethics and morality, as well as aesthetics. There are lots of interesting questions here. I also have a keen interest in the living world and how the sacred and the secular commingle and interact in it, and how this impacts on composers and artists, especially in our own time. This fascination allows me to reflect on and search for the role that people like me might have in societies like ours, and leads me to other questions which might be appropriate for our discussion and thinking today. One question is, is there a moral dimension to the act of composition? And does the work of a composer ever impact on the desire to sustain civic values? I was asked these two very specific questions on a lecture tour a few years ago in Russia, and they have given me great food for thought. My answer, is, my answer to both is yes and no, and some days it veers more towards no than yes, but my indecision is complex. I'd like to start, if I may, with a consideration of the symphony in the modern age. Very specific, I know, bafflingly specific perhaps, but it might provide us with a useful launch pad. I've so far written five, and I'm asked why composers still want to write symphonies today. Haven't all the best ones been written already? Is the form and idea not redundant in the 21st century? Hasn't modernism and postmodernism moved the cutting edge agenda away from the tried and tested? Is it not just nostalgia and conservatism to fall back on an idea from the past? Every composer has considered the possibility of writing a symphony and the questions that will be asked of him or her. Some decide it's not for them, but a surprising number in recent years and in our own time have persevered with the challenge. But in various 20th century symphonies, we can detect the foreboding of the times, the fear and destruction of war and political oppression. There are some works which, in retrospect, have been regarded as barometers of their era. Elgar's Second Symphony was written in 1911, and some detect in it the melancholy tread of civilizational collapse. Mahler's Sixth Symphony was written a few years earlier and is known as his tragic symphony, full of loss, culminating in literal hammer blows of fate. At the very end of the, the symphony, the music becomes truly despairing, perhaps a prophetic harbinger of the conflagration of world war. Both these composers, Elgar and Mahler, for, for both these composers, the symphonist extraordinaire and guiding light was of course Beethoven. Perhaps <clears throat> the crucial and central point in Beethoven's legacy for subsequent generations and centuries is his moral vision. It's a, a phrase he used himself, his moral vision, a prophetic lesson which was to grab the imagination of composers over a century later. These more recent works by Elgar and Mahler and others, like their Beethovenian models, give the impression of having to be written, a compulsion even beyond the will of their creators. I'm reminded of this every time I conduct Von Williams' Fourth Symphony, for example. He saw this piece as pure music, unlike his first three. It's also more severe and angular in its language, not immediately inviting like some of his other music. It's not conventionally beautiful and seems troubled. Written in 1935, two years before Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, similarly another work which signals the extreme anxiety and fear of the times 
The Von Williams also seems to detect the coming storm in Europe. And later the composer said of it, I'm not at all sure if I like it myself now. All I know is that it's what I wanted to do at the time. Beethoven's symphonies have come to be seen as the pinnacle of artistic achievement in music. The distinguished art historian Alessandra Comini described Beethoven's music as having revelatory dimensions. The composer himself described his work as a divine art, and he regarded his symphonies as not merely products of high craftsmanship, but expressions of a moral vision. That phrase again, a deeply rooted belief that great music can move the world. The composer saw his life and work as a mission and a vocation, as many artists have done in centuries and generations gone by. The fact that the modern and now postmodern world, with all its pessimism and skepticism, has nothing convincing to contradict this assessment of the high minded inspiration behind Beethoven's greatness points to the unique unassailability of the composer's achievements and his eternal reputation. To be an effective advocate for the importance of music and the arts in society, the composer must have some engagement with and comprehension of how politics work. Just think how a young composer in mainland Europe must have viewed the world in 1945, emerging from world war, holocaust and fascism. It must, it must have felt as if the old world had failed and deserved to be ditched. For many composers, musical tradition became regarded as flawed, as with all European traditions it had, so they said, led to the Third Reich and mass destruction, that is, the end of culture. And if the old bourgeois traditions and ideas had led to Hitler and to Auschwitz, then those traditions and ideas deserved to be abandoned. Culture, art, music all needed to begin again with a blank page so that this pure virgin territory could be shaped by the new generation and made better. This outlook prevailed in philosophy and politics as well as the arts and one can understand how it gained traction, especially among young idealists. We can never forget that the Holocaust was committed by people from one of the great Western civilizations, one like ours, people who cultivated their fine artistic tastes in music and other forms, people like us. The house at Vanze was a lovely, serene setting for a conference devoted to planning the world's greatest crime. But it was typical for the Nazis to surround themselves with beautiful scenery, classic buildings, classical music and books. Some of the most notorious Nazi concentration camps were built in beautiful locations and had such incongruous features as flower gardens, birdhouses, orchestras. I know, I know a woman who played cello in the, the orchestra at Auschwitz, a library, a zoo, and a swimming pool. Reinhard Heydrich, who chose Vanze for the conference, was an aristocratic and cultured man an athlete and a talented musician, a violinist. His Vanze conference was to meticulously plan the implementation of the final solution and destruction of six million Jews. Most of the participants at this event were educated men and several had law degrees. Many cultured men and women today talk in elevated terms of the spirituality of the arts, I do it myself, and even of the arts filling the vacuum vacated by religion in the modern world. I don't do that though. Because there are lessons from recent history which should make us wary and cautious of this. The German philosopher and musicologist Theodore Adorno, and before I go on any further, I, I realize that uh, quoting the German Marxist Theodore Adorno must be a first at a, a conference like this, so please bear with me. Uh, the German musicologist Theodor Adorno argued famously, and you've probably heard this, that after Auschwitz, it is barbaric to even attempt to write poetry. 
that art can never be a guarantee of empathy or morality or even civilization. The Nazis taught us that with their fine appreciation of classical music. Adorno argued that Auschwitz has demonstrated irrefutably that culture has failed. He said that it could happen in the midst of the philosophical traditions, the arts and the enlightening sciences says more than just that these fail to take hold of and change the people. And he went on to say all culture after Auschwitz, including its urgent critique, is rubbish. <clears throat> this stark analysis asks what culture could possibly mean after the absolute failure of culture. <clears throat> the academic Elaine Martin writes, the Shoah, a systematic mechanical annihilation of a specific group selected on the basis of alleged biological traits and perversely organized with bureaucratic efficiency, was a mockery of the very idea of culture which had survived into the 20th century. What credibility could cultural and artistic discourse possibly have, having themselves emanated from the same culture from which Auschwitz had sprung? And George Steiner wrote, we now know that a man can read Goethe or Rilke in the evening, that he can play Bach and Schubert and go to his day's work at Auschwitz in the morning. The mass murder of millions was carried out within the framework of a society at the peak of cultural and artistic achievement. No wonder many have judged that such a society has lost its legitimacy of artistic discourse after this culture had gone so catastrophically awry. So could Adorno be right when he argued that Auschwitz was far more than just an unpleasant but nonetheless temporary glitch in an otherwise progressive culture? Auschwitz, he said, was part and partial of modernity and progress themselves. Millions of people to wrangle over the figure is in itself inhumane, he, he said, have been systematically murdered. This was no superficial phenomenon. It is not to be seen as an aberration from the otherwise progressive tendencies of progress and enlightenment and supposed steady perfection of humanity. In fact, our still fashionable view that man can be perfected is the very reason our culture has been able to produce the likes of Auschwitz and will continue to do so until humanity embraces a truly radical counter-ontology. The fact that centuries of Enlightenment culture failed to predict and prevent the forces of fascism and eugenics is an implacable indictment of that culture. And remember that eugenics was very popular among the liberal, civilized bien pensant in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Scandinavia before the Nazis got excited about it. And it's back on the agenda today in the modern world's obsession with screening out the disabled. Adorno then wrote, the idea that after this war, life could go on as normal, that culture can be resurrected, as if the resurrection of culture would not itself be its own negation is idiotic. Millions of Jews have been murdered and this should be an interlude and not the actual catastrophe. What exactly is this culture awaiting? <clears throat> Those of us with eyes to look around us might be alarmed to see that we might not need to await too long for another catastrophic answer to Adorno's question. The moral philosopher, the Scottish moral philosopher, I hasten to add, Alistair McIntyre, has suggested that it may have begun already. He suggests that the apparent failures of the Enlightenment project to provide a rational underpinning to our moral life was not just the failures of its distinguished intellectuals, but suggests also that its values cannot be disentangled from the iron fist of so-called progressive politics. They were hand in glove from the start and evident in the revolutionary violence and terror of the French Revolution, a terror which attempted to replace God with revolutionary man, emptying the churches of the images of Jesus and his mother and replacing them with the gods and goddesses of the future. 
And it didn't take long for new, improved man to unleash the violence inherent in the new creed across Europe. And this was to happen time and time again in the centuries ahead. So this was the backdrop to culture at the end of World War II. And its implications continue today. It affected artists, philosophers, writers, politicians, poets, believers, and non-believers, and composers. For many in the 1940s and 50s, there was a feeling that culture had to begin again, free from the stains of all that had gone wrong. What was required was virgin territory, the blank page, the year zero. But perhaps a realistic review of history and culture since the French Revolution is what might be needed. A bracing and useful pessimistic approach to the bogus optimisms which have given us fascism, communism, and Nazism in the 20th century might also be useful in our reappraisals of artistic modernisms too. What would this mean for a composer? Well, the composer, like everyone else, must take, I think, a broad sweeping view of history, embracing the idealistic, moral, symphonic vision and aspirations of Beethoven through to the apparent failures of culture in the 20th century, where even artists and the arts themselves couldn't be trusted to do the right thing. So, to come back to the questions I was asked in Russia a few years ago, is there a moral dimension to the act of composition? And does the work of a composer ever impact on the desire to sustain civic values? <clears throat> the moral dimension is one thing which can transcend era, custom, culture, and religion. But civic values are another thing altogether. What happens if the civic values go wrong? What if the civic majority are mistaken and become seduced by evil? What happens if a society loses sight of what is right and wrong? It takes more than moral courage for a person, an artist or not, to negotiate the opprobrium and possible persecution that attends standing up for goodness and its attendant truth and beauty. It's a favorite rhetorical trick these days, especially amongst the young, to ask, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Meaning, what would be Christ's reaction if he was here now and facing the political and ethical dilemmas of the 20th and 21st centuries? Well, I'm not going to ask such a dramatic question. I'm simply going to ask, what would Beethoven do? In the midst of the political and ethical dilemmas of the 20th and 21st centuries, what would Beethoven have done? Well, he stood on the side of the poor and oppressed when he took a preferential option for them in his prisoner's chorus in Fidelio. He gave expression to the embrace of, of human solidarity in the presence of a loving God in his Schiller setting in the Ninth Symphony. But politics confused even him. One moment, he was dedicating music to Napoleon. The next, he was celebrating his defeat at the hands of the British Army in Wellington at Waterloo. But he was certainly a barometer of his age, but responded in strange and unexpected ways. There's an extraordinary but brief moment in Beethoven's Misa Solemnis where the Lamb of God overcomes the terrors of contemporary war and revolution. Agnus Dei, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Lamb of God, you who take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. In many musical settings of this mass movement, a composer will attempt to invoke solace and peace. But in the Misa Solemnis, the world breaks in. The ontology of violence which seeks to overthrow the kingdom of heaven, the ideology of ever-improving human society, whether we want it or not, invades the sacred text, seemingly attempting to sweep the loving God aside, attempting to take control imperially and to become the new spirit of the age. In this tread of military drums and trumpets, the usurper 
is the revolutionary clamor that sought to bring the merciful Lamb of God to its knees and lead it to the slaughterhouse, a revolutionary clamor which Beethoven himself witnessed at first hand. And in his music, the voices res respond anxiously, fearfully, <clears throat> Dona nobis pacem, but the defiance is there. The counter-ontology is announced and expressed in Beethoven's transformation of the sounds of violence into the glorious mercy of God. And I want to continue this lecture now, ladies and gentlemen, with an exploration of this very point, mercy. This moment in the Misa Solemnis is a signal from musical history that every time the Lamb of God is led to the next slaughterhouse, whether it be in pogrom, gulag, concentration camp, or the constant redefining of human worth and nature, there is an answer and a way of fighting back, a way of remembering who we are and that we are indeed loved, in spite of everything, by a merciful God. Beethoven was an extraordinary seismograph of political ethics and religion. He was inspired by resistance to despots, as well as moral ideals in human behavior. He wrote a Sieger symphony, a victory symphony, for the 16th century hero Egmont and Wellington's victory, not to mention Fidelio, which celebrates married love, freedom from slavery, and the defeat of tyrants. Tyrants can only be defeated by brave resistance, and tyrants must never be flattered. So when the scales fell from his eyes, he changed his mind over the dedication of the Eroica Symphony, and he erased the name of Napoleon from the score when he declared himself emperor. Many talk of Beethoven's search for justice in these works, but it's tempered with a profound knowledge of divine mercy, expressed with insight and vision in his Misa Solemnis and his opera Fidelio. Would he have fallen silent if he had witnessed the Holocaust, according to Theodore Adorno's advice? Or might he, might he have embraced its horror in a new mass setting? He brought a glimpse of mercy in the heart of the abyss into mass and opera. Perhaps that's how composers, poets, and the rest could answer Adorno now too. Why do I think this needs saying? <clears throat> well, in the case of Beethoven, for example, the modern and postmodern world has been engaged in a curious attempt to decatholicize him, even in his most religious works, like the Misa Solemnis. The spin is that it should be seen as a work of generalized spiritual feeling rather than the work of a Catholic composer responding to the mysteries of faith. In fact, it's not with just Beethoven we see this at work. From Mozart's Requiem to Elgar's Dream of Gerontius, commentators fall over themselves to write the Catholic dimension out of any serious reflection and consideration. And it's all of a piece with the general attempts to rewrite history, including musical history, to make cultural memory conform to the fresh new orthodoxies of the present day. So, would that be the same decatholicized Beethoven who wrote in his Heiligenstadt Testament, Almighty God, you look down onto my innermost soul and into my heart, and you know that it is filled with love for humanity and a desire to do good? Or, of whom his closest friend, Anton Schindler, insisted that, quote, his entire life is proof that he, must, that he was truly religious at heart. The same unreligious Beethoven who wrote to a friend, I must live by myself. I know, however, that God is nearer to me than others. I go without fear to him. I have constantly recognized and understood him. Or wrote to the Grand Duke Rudolf, nothing higher exists than to approach God and to extend his glory among humanity. And in fact, this quote uh, may be the answer to some of the questions that I posed at the beginning of my lecture. Nothing higher exists than to approach God and to extend his glory among humanity. Some may be surprised at the way this lecture has turned. 
in the last few minutes. A composer talking about musical creativity will be expected to pursue a musicological direction and the inclusion of both the moral and the civic dimensions of this may lead us to expect a sociological or political investigation too. But I want to explore and interrogate, interrogate the theological dimension of music too. Because many lovers of music, religious and non-religious alike, refer to it as the most spiritual of the arts. The search for the sacred did not end with modernity in music, and if anything, it has grown and become more complex. The story of 20th and now 21st century music is of a complicated and sometimes bewildering re-engagement of composers with metaphysical, spiritual, and downright religious insights. Roger Scruton, in his Death Devoted Heart, makes the claim that this has a lot to do with Wagner, and in particular, Tristan and Isolde. But music, even if it can be at times the most abstract, as well as the most spiritual art form, does not come about in a vacuum. The other arts, and specifically poetry, offer parallel lines of engagement. Poets have very interesting things to say on these and related matters, and their wider implications. I've collaborated especially closely with the poet Michael Simmons Roberts. He highlights Seamus Heaney's reference to the big lightning, the emptying out of our religious language, and David Jones's vision of the English language is littered with dying signs and symbols, specifically the signs and symbols associated with our Judeo-Christian past. Simmons Roberts suggests that the resultant impoverishment hasn't just affected poets, but readers too. And this has been borne out by the now common struggles of English teachers in schools and universities to provide the biblical and historical literacy necessary to make sense of Milton, Dunn, Herbert, T.S. Eliot, and others. Simmons Roberts argues convincingly, I think, that this emptying out of religious language was the unintended or perhaps intended result of what might be described as the Enlightenment project, which for some of those involved was meant to see off religion. Except, of course, that didn't happen. Simmons Roberts notes that, the, that many sociologists argue that it is secularism that's in retreat. Worldwide, the case is clear cut. Christianity and Islam are growing very rapidly throughout the developing world, and a recent report placed the number of atheists worldwide at 3% and falling. It is nonetheless a powerful and well-heeled 3%, almost completely based in the rich West, wielding great clout over matters political, economic, and cultural. In his book, Post-Secular Philosophy, Philip Blonde argues that secular minds are only now beginning to perceive that all is not as it should be, and that what was promised to them, self-liberation through the limitation of the world to human faculties, might after all be a form of self-mutilation. To which Michael Simmons Roberts adds, the myth of the uncommitted artist, that is, free-spirited and unshackled from the burdens of political, religious, and personal commitment, was always an empty one. To be alive in the world is to have beliefs and commitments, and these extend at some level to politics and theology. But this myth has left us with a terror of the imagination enthralled to our belief. Surely, this could limit the scope of the work, may even reduce it to a thin preconceived outworking of doctrine or argument, so the thinking goes. Yet this fear was always confounded, unfounded. The counterexamples are obvious, including great 20th century innovators such as Eliot, Jones, Auden, Moore, Bunting, Berryman. And then there's an equivalent list in their other arts too, Composers searching for the sacred in modernity. Music's list would include Stravinsky, Schoenberg, Olivier Messiaen, Poulenc, the Russians, Gubaidolina, Schnitke, Penderecki from Poland, 
the relationship between creative freedom and religious belief is far from limiting. And most of these writers and composers would argue that their religious faith was an imaginative liberation. Some, like David Jones, have said that this withering of religious faith and the resulting negative reduction of imaginative liberation represents a parching of our culture, a parching of truth and meaning, a drying up of historical associations and resonances, leading to an inability for our culture to hold up valid signs. The etymology of the Latin word religio is interesting, as it implies a kind of binding. Simmons Roberts cites David Jones's essay, Art and Sacrament, where he wrote, the same root is in ligament, a binding which supports an organ and assures that organ its freedom to, of use as part of a body. And it's in this sense that I here use the word religious. It refers to a binding, a securing. Like the ligament, it secures a freedom to function. The binding makes possible the freedom. Cut the ligament and there is atrophy, corpse rather than corpus. If this is true, then the word religion makes no sense unless we presuppose a freedom of some sort. This implies, as Simmons Roberts notes, that the supreme visionary requires religion and theology. He says, so perhaps to free the waters and help slake the thirst of a parched culture, poets and other artists need religion, need a theology. Now there's an unfashionable idea but an interesting and challenging idea indeed. I wonder how that would go down in today's fashionable citadels of metropolitan bien pensant culture. But as Simmons Roberts points out, if David Jones is right, then that image of the free-spirited artist is, and always has been, an illusion. Freedom is not absence. The binding makes possible the freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, over the, our period of modernity, major modernist composers of the last hundred years or, or, so, or so were, in different ways, profoundly religious men and women. Stravinsky was as conservative in his religion as he was revolutionary in his musical imagination, with a deep love of his orthodox roots, as well as the Catholicism he encountered in the West. He set the Psalms. He set the Mass. He was a man of faith. Schoenberg that other great polar figure of early 20th century modern, modernism was a mystic who reconverted to Judaism after he left Germany in the 1930s. His later work is infused with Jewish culture and theology, and he did, pondered deeply on the spiritual connections between music and silence. The great French innovator and individualist Olivier Messiaen was famously Catholic, and every note of his unique contribution to music was shaped by a deep religious conviction and liturgical practice. Messiaen was a powerful influence on the likes of Boulez and Stockhausen, major figures of the post-war avant-garde, and therefore Messiaen far from being a, a conservative and isolated peripheral figure, has to be counted as one of the most impactful composers of modern times. His Catholicism, far from being an impediment, was the major, indeed singular, factor behind this. Messiaen wrote one opera, St. Francis of Assisi. But the most important French Catholic opera of the 20th century was written by Francis Poulenc, his Dialogue of the Carmelites appeared in 1956. And as the, the American Jesuit Mark Bosco comments, no other opera combines 20th century musical sensibilities with such profound theological themes on Catholic mysticism, martyrdom, and redemption. There's no comfortable airy-fairy pick-and-mix spirituality here. It's based on a true story from the beginnings of the aforementioned modern revolutionary violence of 16 Carmelite nuns guillotined in the terror of the French Revolution. It was, an act of, it was an act of a retrospective defiance on the part of the composer against the secular terror of that time and the secular orthodoxies of our modern world. And for a culture that was meant to have put these old things behind it, the dialogue of the Carmelites is probably the most successful modern opera of the last 60 years. 
It's not just another avenue in the search for the sacred, but a bold rebuttal of secular arrogances and certainties and a beautiful proclamation of Catholic truths. Here, as Bosco highlights, traditional Catholicism becomes intellectually compatible with all that was modern and progressive in French culture in the early part of the 20th century. Poulenc's opera is at once a Catholic story of heroism and faith, and yet speaks to the modern world, an opera for the post-war period of Europe in the 1950s, and one resonant with our contemporary struggle with Christian faith and martyrdom. And the list of composers in recent times radi radiating a high degree of religious resonance is substantial, covering a whole generation of post-Shostakovich modernist modernists from behind the old Iron Curtain, um, Goretzky from Poland, Arvo Pert from Estonia, Schnitke Gubaydelina Ustvalska from Russia, all courageous figures in their day who stood out and against the prevailing dead hand orthodoxy of the day state atheism. And in my country, after Benjamin Britten have, have come Jonathan Harvey, John Tavener, and many others. So far from being a spent force, religion has proved to be a vibrant, animating principle in modern music and continues to promise much for the future. It could even be said that any discussion of modernity's mainstream in music would be incomplete without a serious reflection on the spiritual values, belief, and practice at work in the composer's minds. Perhaps then, we are right to search for something beyond the moral and the civic to explore music's wider dimensions today. The search for the sacred, therefore, seems as strong today in music as it ever was. Perhaps that search now, as it was with Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, or in Elgar's The Dream of Gerontius, as it was with the theological rootedness of Messiaen's masterworks, as it was in Poulenc's glorious celebration of the mercy, sacrifice, and redemption at the heart of Catholic teaching, as it is for any artist who stands out and against the transient fashions and banalities of the cultural bien pensant, that search now may be the bravest, the most radical, and the most countercultural vision a creative person can, can have in what Rogers, Roger Scruton described as the attempt to re-sacralize the world around us. And so finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to refer to some things that Pope St. John Paul II wrote on these matters. He sent a letter to the artists of the world in 1999. He wrote, None can sense more deeply than you artists, ingenious creators of beauty that you are, something of the pathos with which God at the dawn of creation looked upon the work of his hands. A glimmer of that feeling has shone so often in your eyes when, like the artists of every age, captivated by the hidden power of sounds and words, colors and shapes, you have admired the work of your inspiration, sensing in it some echo of the mystery of creation with which God, the sole creator of all things, has wished in some way to associate you. He then said, even beyond its typically religious expressions, true art has a close affinity with the world of faith, so that even in situations where culture and the church are, are far apart, art remains a kind of bridge to religious experience. Insofar as it seeks the beautiful, the fruit of an imagination which rises above the everyday, art is by its nature a kind of appeal to mystery. Even when they explore the darkest depths of the soul or the most unsettling aspects of evil, artists give voice in a way to the universal desire for redemption. And John Paul has something to say here to all artists those who believe and those who don't and everyone else in between. He was a barometer of the soul and his thoughts could resonate with different kinds of people. And this aforementioned universal desire for redemption is echoed in these following words by him which resonate with my thoughts about music, composition and many other aspects of our human condition today. He said, Apart from the mercy of God, there is no other source of hope for mankind. We should maybe let those words resonate for a moment. Um, the, the, the answer to the questions raised throughout this lecture. Apart from the mercy of God, 
there is no other source of hope for mankind. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there is something in mercy that is rather humbling to all sides, which is why some secularists despise it as a pity that shames human nature. To say that we all need it undermines modernity's shibboleth of autonomy. They claim that I can give myself the law or meaning because my nature is perfectly intact and needs no redemptive underpinning from the sky fairy and his grace. Real peace and understanding based on an ontology of divine love requires a recognition that we are all needy sons and daughters of Adam, needy of mercy, which is our redemptive truth and, in the end, our liberation. Thank you.